Hey, everybody. It is Jay Campbell, uh, the author of, I don't know, too many books and a lot of different websites. And I'm joined by my great friend, um, Nelson Bergel of Excel Mail, Discounted Labs, hey, and now Campbell. Clinic uh, Optimizers. My bad. Too many books. Didn't catch that. Nelson, how are you, brother? I'm doing well. Can you hear me okay? Jay? Hear you perfect. You sound perfectly crystal clear. Hey, thanks a lot, man, for uh, inviting me again. I had a fun time last time we had, I think we talked about HCE or Metformin. So, yep. and the guys, uh, the guys are giving me very good input from uh, reviews from, from the videos you're doing. And congratulations on the new book, man. I mean, it's, it's like kicking butt, huh? Thanks, man. Yeah, it's number one uh, overall on Amazon for men's health and like three other categories now right now. So, yeah, it's doing really well. well. Oh, great. Great. Well, let's jump, jump into it. Um, today, I'm going to deal with probably the most controversial topic in testosterone replacement and men's health in general, at least in my point of view. Uh, the topic that has the most uh, uh, misconceptions, uh, the most uh, myths, the most abuse when it comes to dosing or lack of management uh, from, from different physicians, uh, a topic that the data still is evolving. So, um, so it's, it's not an easy one to go over. So I've tried really hard to go through all the studies that are published so far, and I found some good ones and some weak ones. So you'll see what I mean, and hopefully, um, you know, it makes some sense to you. By the way, I have 135 slides, but I'm only going to speak, I'm only going to cover probably 20%. So the slides are going to be available for your uh, download uh, soon. So this real, is just... Real quick, Nelson, let me tell everybody. So guys, uh, there's probably going to be a lot of you watching. Please save your questions for the end. We definitely will try to do your, our best to answer your question. As Nelson said, this is a huge deck. So we're going to try to go through the slides that are most important. But if you see something that you want to address, just save it for the end. So this is just a disclaimer that I always uh, put ahead of everything. I'm not here to recommend anything. I'm not a clinician. Talk to your doctor. Um, if you want to change anything in your, under your treatment plan. So it's just an informational uh, lecture. So this is where, uh, this is like my freebie slide. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like uh, my plug, my shameless plug file uh, uh, slide. I never do this, but I'm learning a few things from you, Ajay, you know, I'm becoming a better marketer. But anyways, um, yeah, you know, I, I said 123, it's actually 135 slides, and they're all going to be available um, on that link that I just posted there. So um, as soon as the lecture is done, I'm going to upload um, a handout with all the slides. So don't worry too much if I go too fast, because I will go too fast. And uh, I'm only covering maybe 20% of, of the slides. And I have appendixes that actually go into detail on every single thing I mention on the main slides. A free download. I'm actually giving my, my uh, book, Testosterone Minds Guide, for free. There's a link there. I know, right? And yeah, I'm learning a few things from you, Jay. And there's also a few other offers that I'm offering on that link. And obviously, to get answers to questions, I have a forum, a men's health forum that is very well attended, excelmail.com. And I also own the company, discountedlabs.com. We provide the lowest cost blood test all over the United States. Uh, and we provide also the prescription. So there is no need to go see a doctor. Uh, for clinicians, and I say doctors basically um, mid-levels like uh, you know, uh, physician's assistants or, or nurse practitioners that want to get some more education on the field, um, please contact us on clinicoptimizers.com. So let's proceed. That was just my shameless plug. So, uh, you know, we, we, we suffer in different ways uh, from stigma in this field. Uh, there's this hormone phobia or hormone stigma, not only the bodybuilding side, but actually even the men's health side in which we are obviously not using high doses of androgens and we are trying to just do physiologic doses. We still have stigmas that are affecting not only men's health, they're affecting women's health. And the first one is obviously for women, uh, men and everybody else thinks, well, women don't need or need testosterone, don't, don't have or need testosterone. And we know very well, and especially if you've been in our forums on Jay's or mine, that um, women, have testosterone and they need testosterone for the same reasons that men need testosterone. So that's a that's a you know a stigma misconception. The same thing goes with men. People think men should knock down their bad for men. You should knock it down. 
In fact, as we have all the data I'm going to be showing of the roles of estradiol, obviously everything in the hormone world is balanced. Too much or too little is not good. Uh-oh, we have a transmission problem here. I have no idea why. Can you guys hear us? Say hi if you can hear. <laughs> Not good. Not good. You had good reception. Oh, you're back now. What is going on? I have good reception. Very good. good you know. I have good reception too. I never oh. left. Well, uh, keep you tell going, me. If you... Okay, keep hey going. guys. <laughs> Hopefully, it will not be more than once because uh, I'm really damn. I'm prepared today. It's but okay. anyway, this is, the, this, is, this is the reality of doing live broadcasts on the internet. Anyways, so let's move on. Uh, the same thing. Switching back to men, testosterone will make you aggressive. I mean, if you tell your friends I'm on testosterone, hey man, you're gonna get it, or even your your female partner. So. All these misconceptions, stigmas, uh, concepts of bad hormones versus good hormones are just completely off. Uh, another one that it's, you know, there's some evidence that high, very high estradiol may make a man moody or bloated or asexual and even make him grow hoops. So I'm here to show some of that data, see where we are whether or not we have uh, strong evidence or it's just assumptions or bro science uh, from, from internet sites. And that's, that's where the biggest challenge comes when it comes to, to the data uh, that I'm gonna be presenting. So real quick, the agenda that I have, and as I said, I'm not gonna cover probably everything here, but you guys are gonna be able to see the slides. Uh, limitations of the current data, there are lots of limitations. Um, we're gonna talk about the blood test uh, and accuracy. Uh, a basics on estradiol in men 101, I call it, just the roles, uh, estro estrogen types, epidemiology, things of that nature. We, I'm going to review studies um, that have looked at low and sometimes high estradiol in men, uh, and I have different uh, parameters there, as you see, high or low, uh, different things that we, we're going to review. Um, I may not cover all of them, as I said, because of time limitations. Uh, should we monitor the ratio of testosterone to estradiol? So I'll, I'll be explaining a little bit of that. Is there a, a sweet spot? These are questions that I get all the time online on, on Facebook or, or um, Excel mail. Will be available now. <laughs> okay, so limitations, and I, I, I like to be clear with, like I did with my foreman um, at the beginning of the lecture, not to make assumptions on things that have been uh, published before, because there are lots of holes in those studies. Most of the data that we have on it, under 350, under 400 or so, so very little data from men that are actually taking testosterone. Okay, and most of the studies were using the old estradiol blood test that has been shown to overestimate estradiol. So that's a big deal too. I mean, all the estradiol numbers that we probably saw in the studies are higher than they probably would be otherwise if measured by the liquid chromatography test. Um, we have not a single study, not one, and I've looked, I've been looking for months, that measures quality of life related limit right. uh, in men on testosterone on testosterone replacement. So we don't really have a strong, strong feeling of what the highest number in the range should be. Most labs are using 40 to 50 right. as the highest side of picograms, obviously per milliliter. And uh, I, I'm gonna show you guys uh, from Europe that are using, or Canada or Australia, they're using other units how to convert so that we can talk to each other. It's sometimes hard to talk about numbers. Well, Nelson, let me ask you a question yeah. on that because you know all the, the best doctors all say that they still treat symptoms what do you think in your mind is an upper range limit where even if they're are, they're asymptomatic, it's a potential issue? I think, you know, I hardly see, and you're going to see some of the data I'm going to see. I have hardly seen uh, estradiol measured by liquid chromatography higher than 50. 
right. picograms, picograms per milliliter. Um, so uh, above that, unless you are really cycling huge amounts of testosterone, <laughs> above that, then, you know, even without symptoms, it will be interesting to see why why that's the case if the person is fatter. So I'm going to talk about fat mass, liver, right. liver metabolism, uh, even testicular function, because estradiol comes from different tissues, right? right. So, so um, but yeah, I mean, I, the most labs go up to 50, but obviously their, their uh, ranges are not using men uh, with testosterone of 1,000 or yeah. or 800, like a lot of our, the guys that are in our well, audience, yeah. both of you, Jay and me. So the lower the lower limit, however, that's the lower side of the, of the range is actually becoming clearer and clearer. And we have a lot of good data there, actually very good placebo control, double, double blinded. I mean, it's, it's really good. And it's 10 to 15 picograms. Anything right. below that is going to start creating problems with loss of bone bone density, yes, absolutely. which is, is very, you know, right now I tell people, well, you're not going to have a symptom if you're losing bone. Right. You may have a, you know, higher calcium in your blood or whatever, but you're not going to have a symptom. And it's going to take years, maybe yeah. two, 20, 30, when you start having fractures. So, you know, you may not think it's a big deal, but it will be a big deal when you get to the the age of, you know, uh, like me, I'm, I'm almost 60 now. So, but anyways, um, only three studies actually explore something that I'm very, very interested in is the testosterone to estradiol ratio, because as testosterone goes up, so does estradiol and DHT. And they're f for different reasons. The body really makes estradiol and DHT to balance or even complement or boost testosterone's effect. So they're like, they're cousins. They're not evil twins or triplets, you know? Right. So that's why I say, uh, and the T to E ratio makes sense because, you know, if we see changes on the percent of T that is converting into E2, uh, usually there's no more than up to 3% in some cases, uh, conversion of armatization. So I'm going to go through that. I'm not going to hate of myself. Only two contradictory studies uh, actually used an astrosol. Uh, in men on testosterone <laughs> replacement at one milligram a day. So that's the thing. I mean, a lot of the studies using an astrosol using high doses, uh, although as you well know, Jay, and the yep. doctors still prescribing a very high dose of one milligram a day of- Crazy. Um, yeah. So anyway, I don't want to get on my soapbox because otherwise it will take forever. And I'm, <laughs> I'm not here to jeopardize my relationship with doctors. So, um, so the role, the role of estradiol, so really basic uh, and, most of the guys probably watching this already know, but I just have to cover this list of a uh, little bit of the basics here. Testosterone gets aromatized, uh, aromatized to estradiol um, in the liver, in the testicles, in fat cells, and we're actually finding out that there are other tissues that also have aromatase activity. And their, their benefits are actually very important roles of, of estradiol in men. Uh, and women too, but I'm, I'm concentrating today about men. Brain uh, function, there's some data on cognitive function. Uh, if we, in men especially that do not have estradiol, they may have a mutation that doesn't allow their body, an aromatase mutation that affects cognitive function. Cardiovascular, uh, estradiol is involved in lipid metabolism, especially, especially on HDL. And HDL actually low is goes down with testosterone, higher doses of testosterone. So that's very important that it's estradiol actually prevents a lot of that lowering of HDL. Uh, obviously, there is a big effect on the mammary gland. That's why people get, some people get gynecomastia. And I have a whole section on gyno because gyn gynecomastia is probably the most complex issue that yeah. we have in estradiol because it is not one factor or two factors. Sometimes it's a combination of three or four factors that need to be present for a man to have um, grow, uh, growth of uh, breast tissue um, with or without high estradiol. So I'm going to go through a little bit of that basics. And as when you download the handout, you're going to see a whole section on the clinical management of gynecomastia. And Jay is going to add a lot to that because he's you're also very uh, an expert on, on gyno and especially on surgery. Uh, liver. Um, also uh, estrogen or estradiol. And by the way, you're going to see the word estrogen and trying, I can try to delete most of the estrogen words because doctors and papers tend to use more, either term, estrogen or estradiol. Yeah. I'm going to show you that estrogen is actually three different estrogens into, you know. So when I say estrogen, forgive me, I mean estradiol, some, some of these graphics, uh, I, I try to do a good job, but it's, it's still there. Um, 
the reproductive tract, obviously, estradiol is made in the testicles of men. Aromatase activity occurs there. And there's some, you know, contra contradictory data on prostate uh, enlargement, okay? And bone, obviously, that's the strongest data we have estradiol. Estradiol is testosterone without estradiol does not protect against bone loss. Right. You have to have bone, uh, estradiol present. So that is definitely probably the most, um, the strongest data we have because it's been going on. I mean, the studies have been going on for a while. So, uh, yes, yeah, I said before, these are basically the benefits of keeping a balanced estradiol level. Obviously, there's arguments on what that means. You know, is that, does that mean a 25 picogram right. per milliliter or does that mean a 45? I say, it, for me, as I said, you cannot say this number is what we all have to go through when there's a man that has 500 nanograms of testosterone and another man that has a thousand. Right. We cannot use the same measure. So I'm going to speak a little bit about testosterone to estradiol ratio. But anyways, estradiol is, uh, is involved in all these uh, important uh, things that are, obviously you don't, want, you don't want to shut down this hormone and many people do because they uh, take too much uh, anastrozole or the doctors don't know how to manage them. Or they think estradiol is evil, okay? <laughs> so really, I'm not gonna spend too much time here, otherwise, you know, I'll bore the hell out of you. Obviously, you see a penis there and brain and <laughs> testicles. So there's actually um, uh, receptors, estradiol, alpha and beta. Now we have two receptors and we're, studies are, are now trying to find out what each receptor does. Not only what each receptor does, but also what each estrogen, and I'll, I'll talk about what the types do to the body. So it's a, it's, believe me, we're in the infancy of estradiol yeah. research in men. In women, we have a lot more data for sure. So their, their effects on the brain, as I said, in the penis itself, uh, the, 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 the vasculature and, and actually the, the sensitivity of the receptors there are important. And I keep hearing guys that have, uh, undetectable estradiol, that they've lost their sensitivity in their penis. Uh, the Leydig cells, as I said, are also affected. And if you don't have enough estradiol, you also cannot make enough sperm or quality yeah. sperm. So um, bone, just going to go through quickly because it's enough data to say you have to have enough otherwise. Um, and under 10, we're talking about pico moles here, by the way, I, I was going to translate it, but I'll show you how to do that. But we do know for sure that, uh, and I'm going to skip it, that low estradiol is not good for you because your bones may become brittle with time. So there are three types, and estradiol is the main one. Estradiol is the most studied one, the most, um, yeah, the, the most active one. Um, estradiol, estrone, and um, I'm sorry, es es <laughs> I repeat estradiol there twice. Yeah. It's estriol, estradiol, and estrone. Yeah. And you can see, I'm sorry about that. This is, a, I just I just finished this slides this morning. Jay, have, Jay oh, made you only allowed one mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so, uh, estrone is the strongest. Est estrone is uh, 50 to 70% less active. As you can tell, if you, if you scroll down in the uh, graph here, this is a cascade of hormones. It'll give you a headache if you really want to get into it. But, you know, cholesterol is a main uh, uh, molecule that is converted into all these different um, hormones in the cascade. And that down below, on the last end of the bottom, you have the estrogens uh, the, the, from the aromatization of testosterone and androstenedione, which is a precursor of, of testosterone. So really, estriol, even though it seems like it's the last one in the uh, in the cascade, it actually has the, lowest, uh, the, the least uh, effect on. So far, we don't even have enough data to say for sure what estriol and estrone do in men. That's, that's the problem I've been having, trying to get more data. But I know that 90% of the data, we have it on estradiol. It's the most abundant too and the most uh, active, okay? So um, E1, E2, and E3. So we are basically, when we talk from now on, on these slides, we're talking about E2, 17 beta estradiol. Um, the highest affinity for a, a, the receptors, the one that attaches to the receptors, the best and the fastest is E2 uh, beta, the, the one we're always talking about, is estradiol, okay? Um, so I'm gonna concentrate just on estradiol because as I said, the data on all the other smaller uh, and less active uh, estrogens is not as clear as we would like to for it to be. So um, why, this is one of the reasons why some men are afraid of estradiol. 
because they've been told that the higher the estradiol, and these are main not on testosterone, these are main producing their normal levels of testosterone without testosterone replacement. And obviously, if their estradiol goes up, there's a feedback mechanism and also testosterone that tells the hypothalamus in the brain and the pituitary gland, slow down, no more LH, no, no more testosterone, bring this down. So it is, both testosterone and estradiol have an inhibitory effect on this cascade. So, you know, the the reason is, well, if we shut down estradiol, we will not have that inhibition. And that was the old school kind of thinking. And obviously we know better now because those men tended to lose bone and other, other problems. So no, it's all about balances. It's not about shutting down something just because you're assuming your testosterone is gonna go down. But obviously that's a mood subject. When you are taking testosterone, um, that effect is, is bypassed because we're taking, we're giving our bodies testosterone from the outside world. So, um, yeah, E2 compared to testosterone, e, uh, estradiol is actually f stronger at bringing LH and FSH down through this inhibitory um, feedback loop. And the, the testosterone is really the substrate, the, the, the precursor of 80% of, of estradiol. Uh, and most, most studies, however, as I said, use the old uh, immunoassays. Wow which have limited the precision and, but it is what it is, man. We had that data, everybody was using the same wrong test. So we can compare the data to apples to apples, you know? So I don't think it's wasted uh, research. It's just, well, let, let me ask you a question, Nelson. So regarding that, are all, is, is LabCorp then in Quest and all the major testers now using the right chromatography no, or is it still? No, 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 I, I you know, at this kind of labs, what I did to avoid this confusion, I just, I, I deleted the regular estradiol test, which is used in women. And, okay. you know, with higher estradiol levels, it doesn't really matter. The, the noise, the interference of estradiol in different, in two different tests happens basically at the range of males. And, and, and this immunoassay, um, I'm gonna have another slide of that, actually overestimates because it detects inflammatory markers right, like right. C-reactive protein, C-reactive, yeah. it detects like it is estradiol, so it overestimates it. If you don't have that much inflammation, if your CRP is low, maybe the two tests are, are closer to, to each other's value, you know, and the more the fancier, newer test is obviously a little more expensive than the old test. So some guys and some doctors are still using the old test for cost reasons. <laughs> You know, I, I really, um, I say, if you're gonna measure something and monitor something, you better mess, well, just do, do it, it right. 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 Yeah, and the same thing happens for everything. I mean, liquid chromatography is becoming the gold standard for most measurements of hormones because it, it really, that technology has very little interference. So um, as I said, um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip over this because, uh, yeah, substantial fraction of E2 is bound to sex hormone binding globulin, like testosterone. But testosterone, um, sex hormone binding globulin binds to estro estradiol less uh, strongly than to testosterone. But there is, there's some competition between testosterone and estradiol for, for, for binding into the sex hormone binding globulin. So what does that mean? So all the studies that we, well, I'm gonna show two that haven't, had looked at total estradiol. Most of us, myself included, uh, doctors, measure total estradiol by liquid chromatography. Should we be measuring free estradiol too? Like, you know, we have this total testosterone, right. free testosterone. We know the free um, um, portion of testosterone is, is the active one. However, and I've been thinking, because I, I have that test um, at discounted labs, it's a lot more expensive too, um, but there's no data on free estradiol in men. Right. So, but I think that's coming and a lot of guys are asking me, should I measure the free, to, free estradiol instead of, uh, of the total? As I said, all the data we have is on total. <clears throat> so the accuracy, as I said, this is a, what I just said. If your doctor is using, and if you, uh, I tell guys, First of all, you you own your blood work by right. <laughs> by law by law. All of us, if we request our copy of our blood work, we should get one by law. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. 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 Don't ask, don't tell. Right. Don't ask, don't tell. Um, secondly, when you look at the blood work, if you see this this word E C L I A, that's the old test. And right. you're going to see it. Um, so just make sure that's not what you see. If, if it is, well, tell your doctor, what do you think about, don't, 
don't confront your doctor directly. I, I think every everybody's human. Everybody needs to be uh, approached, uh, you know, with, with touch. So the liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, LCMS, is, is a right test that actually accurately measures testosterone. So Nelson, would you say though that, you know, be, to, do, to get this done right, you have to be proactive, right? I mean, you have to go on Excel mail, watch what we're doing. <laughs> Talk to this about your doctor, like you said, in a very non-tactful way, you know, non-attacking way, yeah. so that they do do it right. Uh, because otherwise, unfortunately, it's probably not going to happen. You know, Jay, uh, I'm, I'm doing some consulting for some clinics right now, and they asked me to um, do an analysis of the of the a testosterone clinic market, especially for website design, blah, 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 right. you know. I went through probably 148 websites, clinics that are popping up everywhere. I mean, you know, they're more like Starbucks. Um, right. So we have a lot of clinics out there, um, just cookie cutter stuff, uh, protocols that are overdosing with an astrosol measure. Oh, yeah. So I, what I'm telling guys is that don't feel, because some guys feel like, well, the doctor should know this. And, you know, I pay the doctor something. I mean, I shouldn't be, I, I'm busy, man. I mean, they should be taking care of all these details. And you know what? They're right. They're right by saying that. If you're paying somebody, like you're paying a, or a mechanic to fix your car, you don't have to be doubting what, well, you know, if you have a good one, <laughs> doubting their work. So on, it is not like, uh, like any other service. When it comes to uh, this field, which is not really rocket science, I'm seeing a lot of abuse and a lot of uh, mistreatment. So yes, you have to be, you have to be educated if you want to maximize the benefits of right. not only testosterone, but all the other stuff that Jay and I talk about constantly. So, um, so cause, causes of high estradiol. And as I said, we're still debating, is it 45, 50, let's say 40 to 50. Uh, unless, as I said, you're, you're taking so much testosterone. And I'll show you guys, by the way, I have like a graph that shows what happens when you increase the dose of testosterone and estradiol? It actually tends to plateau. It doesn't right. go up you know, all the way. So uh, estradiol treatment and, you know, they're, they're in, in prostate cancer. Believe it or not, there's some doctors that use estradiol treatment for improving quality of life. And actually, it shows quality of life. These are men that have no testosterone. They have the testosterone blocked. And um, they have found that giving estradiol to them the same worsen the, the prostate cancer and actually makes them feel uh, better emotionally and cognitively. So the increased aromatization of T2E to estradiol in the liver or fat cells because of many reasons. I have a, a few other slides. Genetic mutations, that's really where we get in a tricky and that's why some guys say, well, why me, man? I mean, I take 100 milligrams and poof, my, my nipples start, you know, giving me problems with yeah. um, and and other people are you know taking three times the dose and they have no problem yeah. so that's a part of the equation that most people don't want to talk about but there's actually data on genetic mutations that make you more prone to having gynecomastia and even some other issues so or aromatase enzyme in the liver there's a mutation there too that could happen so are you one of those guys well only blood testing will do and, uh, and, and symptology so I'm not, what I'm trying to say, a lot of these studies did not look at that special population. And there's some, because I know I have, you know, clients and friends that, that really have had this problem, even with beautiful numbers, you know. So anyways, the T to E ratio, and this is something I'm going to focus on in, in the next months, trying to push for more research, you know, and it doesn't take anything. You just measure T and E2, divide them and plot them with, you know, with different dosages. That's, that's actually anybody any researcher, any PhD student could do a meta-analysis going back to all the data that we have and divide the damn numbers, even with the old test, and see how the T ratio, and I'll show you why I think it's important. There are medications, I mean, you know, in HIV, we have a medication that caused gynecomastia because it increases estradiol. Uh, people that have epilepsy, um, they their medications also are prone to cause uh, gynecomastia. So I'm gonna show a few, but medications themselves can, can be a problem. Higher boss, uh, body mass index, higher fat yeah. mass, because yeah. that's really where aromatase sure. sits the most. Older age too, uh, we have some data that older men tend to convert more uh, mm -hmm. Uh, to uh, from testosterone to estradiol, other hormones effects. You know, their thyroid issues, low or high, or even some growth hormone in, issues that I may cover soon. Certain foods, maybe soy, uh, flaxseed. There's still controversy there. I don't touch soy. 
I don't oh. soy milk. <laughs> I don't I'm final estrogens are good for your prostate. No, no, because I, I've seen data that is very strong, uh, linking very strongly uh, uh, certain phytoestrogens to, to gynecomastia and other issues. So environmental toxins and that more and more data, we're getting data almost every other week on environmental toxins that are actually increasing estradiol in men, especially the problem in younger men. Yeah. So you're, still, you're still developing. So, um, and obviously we're, there's nothing we're doing about it. That's basically plastic pollution that is seeping into a chain. And certain micronutrient I'm, I'm, I've learned a lot in the past month about that because that was one of the weakest parts of my estradiol knowledge. And I'll show you, uh, I have a pretty um, graph um, soon. I'm going to just mention one sentence. This is the fact that we're learning that not only estradiol has different roles, but alpha, the receptor alpha or beta, have different roles too. And some of them, like the, you know, that we call it estrogen receptors, ERs. You, you see these receptors in the brain, liver, fat, lung, bladder, bone marrow, uh, you know, in the penis, in the urethra, in the seminal, you see them everywhere. So that is just telling researchers to look into the effect of each one of these receptors on each one of these organs. But we're just evolving, as I said, it, it, this, <laughs> this field gets more complicated as I dig into it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the potential, and I say potential is because something that you think is for sure, for sure, a symptom of high estradiol, and this is where I see, this slide here is where I see 95%, I'm, I'm exaggerating, let's say 60% of the chatter that happens on Excel Mail or the Facebook testosterone group are happening because of this. Oh, guys, I'm having nipple sensitivity. Uh, I need to I need to take one milligram a day of, of <laughs> and the, and I, the first question that the people ask them is, have you do you know your number? No, I don't. No, 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 I, no. I, I'm going to prevent it. I, I, I just need to start taking it right now. So anyways, fluid retention. That's that's also another one. I'm, I'm holding water. It has to be the estradiol. Some guys measure the estradiol comes back normal. Oh, what is it? So I have some data on the fact that cortisol may actually be accumulating in our bodies. Salt, when we take testosterone, that that's our sodium up, uh, you know, uptake increases. So we're very sensitive to salt. And I love my stuff, you know, my salty food sometimes. But yeah, I hold water a lot. I, I tend to have this problem. And my estradiol is like 25. So I, I'm going to show one indication that even, you know, anabolic steroid users uh, that are using DHT analogs like, uh, you know, oxanolone or others, that basically DHT blocks estradiol receptors, even them can get um, um, water retention. So I just know that the fluid retention story is not supported. I'm not saying it doesn't cost uh, high estradiol. I'm just saying, usually, if you don't know your number, you better know it because you'll be surprised that it, it is not. And you're going to over treat yourself with an astrosol and you're going to tank your estradiol. And it takes a while for a lot of guys to recover to. Oh, it's that. terrible when you tank your estradiol. Yeah, I mean, people, most people feel more tired, more moody, uh, lack of sensation in the penis and, uh, and achy. That's another yeah. thing I hear from. Absolutely. And this is all anecdotally. I was trying to find more data on achiness and joint health. And there's some, but in vitro, that actually shows that estradiol actually is an anti-inflammatory agent. It decreases yeah. IL-2, IL TNF, alpha, and all that. Low mood, there's only one study that actually showed that men, older men with higher estradiol had more incidence of depression. So, hey, maybe, maybe there's something. Decreased libido. There is some evidence that, yeah, higher estradiol, especially in, in cardiovascular patients, has may have an issue there. Uh, increased venous leakage, and there's a tiny study that said that the the guys with older guys with higher estradiol had more venous leakage in their penis, meaning their 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 blood is not staying locked in to have an erection or a good one. It's leaking back to the to the you know. To the body so um but that's a very small study but one that is definitely definitely concerning obviously for for obvious reasons for most of us so the the kind of that's really probably the most the number one fear for a lot of the guys uh, you know one of those that i may have no no genetic predisposition because i've never had that problem even with different doses and you know i 
I've only taken an astro soul once in my life for three days, and uh, that was too, long, too that was too long. <laughs> well, I don't know. well, you know, I'm not gonna. I'm, as I said, I'm, <laughs> there's a genetic, there's a genetic effect. It really is. I don't know how many men um, may have, and we don't we don't test for genetic mutations and aromatase enzymes. So, right. uh, but for those that do, an astro soul may actually help. I mean, like, prevent. Um, I'm going to show that, uh, and there, as I said, you see here in this picture, different types, different degrees of gynecomastia it could be like from very slight to very severe. And, and, and for doctors that are specialized in, and you know a good one, by the way, you wouldn't want to mention his name in, in LA. Yeah, for uh, sure. The, the, ones that mention, the ones that are working with gynecomastia, their first challenge is, is it really increasing gland size on, you know, mammary gland, or is it fat cells? Right. You know, because if it's fat, obviously it's not gyno, but if it's, and I tell people, you'll know because there's like a little cherry size feeling under your nipple. It and, hurts. Yeah, it hurts. And, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, so let me just go on because there's a little bit more on this. So gynecomastia, potential hormonal factors is never one hormone. Yeah. That's why I want to tell people it's never only about estradiol. Uh, yeah, I wish it was that simple. I really wish. I think we tend to, um, think about hormones in a one or two dimensional um, right. way. And I don't, I, I don't blame people for thinking that way because that's, that's how we've been taught to think. But everything in hormones is probably more than three dimensional. I mean, we, like you have to have, in some cases, um, definitely you have to have low T and high E2. Yep. Uh, and so that's why I'm very interested in the T to E2 ratio. They, in some cases you may have normal, like normal T, let's say 400, 500 nanograms but you have a very low dht and high e2 that's also could be a problem and there's some a little bit of evidence on this this is actually some of it is anecdotal and some of it is not the igf1 issue we have data on teenagers what they just found that that was the main factor in teenage gynecomastia is the fact that the igf1 growth hormone uh, production increased while everything else increased but that was the number one statistical significant um a factor and and none of the the first three really matter if you got if you have poly four we call them polymorphisms uh, genetic polymorphisms that make you more prone for gyno you'll have them even with different ratios and different hormone combinations so that's where it gets really tricky i i hate when people generalize gynecomastia is not as simple as people say and you'll see yeah. if, when you guys download the handout you're going to see the gynecomastia management side that it's it'll tell you how much work they have to do doctors have to do to get to there yeah it's crazy let me just real quick share with mine and you know this um yeah. so i had 750 800 tests my estradiol never varies it's never over 35 i mean i think i've seen it at 41 but i was playing around with peptides and I'm positive, as you said, and we theorized that it had to do something with elevated IGF. And mine just came out of nowhere after 14 years of being on testosterone. I literally, it literally came out of nowhere, it had no other symptoms. Um, so you're right, stress, cortisol, life changes. There's so many things, there's so many variances. And you're right, the only solution when you have that occurrence where it's not going to be reduced by drugs. Um, or any kind of medications is to use a surgeon who is very skilled in the art of removing the glands, as you said, because that's the only way it will come back. We've heard many, many times where surgeons will remove the fat tissue and then guess what? A year later or less, it's back. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. But, you know, part of me, and I've spent a few days working on this slide set, um, <laughs> was looking for data on a percentage of men on testosterone replacement that gay gynecomastia. I couldn't yeah, find a single, and I've read, I swear, I was, I get OCD. And um, no, in my estimates, in my anecdotal, I've been around for 30 years, I would say no more than 10 to 20%. If you're not playing around with good growth hormone or peptides or other things that are increasing your IGF-1. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The, there's a lot more gynecomastia in men with low testosterone. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's, that really, uh, especially men, get this when you have prostate cancer and they have found that you know blocking the your just testosterone production is a way to go to because there's some some genetic um, uh, influences and, and test hormone uh, influences on prostate cancer if they shut down your testosterone which also shuts down your estradiol but what happens is that testosterone 
converts into estradiol, but estradiol is also produced in other tissues independently of testosterone blood levels. So right. there's, a, there's a little more estradiol, the testosterone is zero. Those guys get gynecomastia, you know, and they have very little to no, no testosterone. But anyways, what is a good range for estradiol? You know, mm, most doctors are using 20 to 50. I heard that a doctor wants people to be 10. I heard that doctors, there's a wow. doctor that gives you one milligram a day of an astrosol. <laughs> he wants to see no an astro, no estradiol. <laughs> but um, the lab test uh, ranges go anywhere from 15 to 45 to 50. As I said, it's not all about the range. You said it, so it's right. symptoms. It's about all the other factors. What right. I want to make sure, though, is that people understand that just because your nipples are sensitive doesn't mean yeah, that you have gyno or that you're going to get gyno exactly. because there's actually one study done in rats. I don't even know how to measure sensitivity. That actually shows that testosterone replaced testosterone uh, treatment increases sensitivity of the nipple area in many men that have nothing to do with estradiol blood level. Right. So that's something that I see a lot. I see guys like freaking out when they're nipples are sensitive or itching a little and they just start taking an astrosol blindly and uh, you know but hey as i said i can't i can go on forever um more gyno here obviously uh, and i i found this picture i said wow that is very cool because these are different degrees uh yep. nice. from, and you know sometimes you see younger like smaller bodybuilders to fatter guys and they're different types uh to the point that some in some cases it hangs the, the tissue hangs so it's um it's very concerning and very it's not only a cosmetic issue i think guys that really get traumatized by by this really becomes their obsessive uh, obsession and it's 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 horrible to see um you losing your self-esteem or you don't want to be shown without a shirt because well well mine was so minor but it wasn't a point of like oh, if i remove my shirt you could really notice it but obviously if my daughter's Monica, any loved one, anyone, and I, you know, I would um, embrace them. It, the pain was insane. And then also, too, you know, this heat, um, excessive heat and humidity can set it off, too, and flare it. So huh. it's it's crazy, like, what happens when you have just a tiny little bit that you can't remove other than, than through surgery. Yeah, and some doctors are better at removing the whole thing than others, right? Absolutely, yeah. So I, I'll just throw the name out there. If you guys, any of you guys are in Southern California, Dr. Joseph Cruz. He's literally the guy probably in the world. I have a whole chapter on gyno in the new book, the testosterone optimization therapy Bible, but he's an amazing guy. He's in uh, Laguna Beach, not Laguna Beach, Orange County and also Beverly Hills, but Dr. Joseph Cruz. All right, good. I'm going to go through this real quick. Otherwise we're going to be here forever, but this is a study and it's kind of cool actually to see these graphs. These are kids, uh, boys from like seven years of age to they follow these boys to I think it was 15 or 16. And you see in one, in one side free testosterone, the bottom one is estradiol, the right hand side IGF-1 and the uh, bottom side is uh, IGF-P3, uh, which is like the, the binding global length of growth hormone. But you see obviously they're going through, so you know, when we are, when we feel hornier, when we're like, you know, 12, 13, and we're like, don't know how to handle our sex drive and you know that's what's happening this this increases in in all the hormones especially obviously there's a in some cases you even see humongous peaks these are different patients obviously uh obviously increases in free testosterone and and estradiol but a humongous you know increases actually that's where they found the most significant changes in igf1 so there's this growth hormone you know uh, effect that is it, it it makes testosterone and estradiol even work in sync to make that mammary gland grow. Growth hormones actually make things grow. So, so this is, and, and most guys don't get their IGF ch checked. It, it ain't no. cheap, that's why, but it is one, another factor. It's another factor. Um, oops, I, I think I scrolled this thing down too much, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Um, this is another myth, um, and I really believe it's more, and I wish it was a simple, actually, I wish this was not true. I wish that water retention was linked to estradiol. I wish that we could take an astrosol and just lose water. I really do. That would be so cool. Uh, <laughs> but I tried. It doesn't work. You know, the only thing that really makes you uh, lose water after you retain it is cutting down your salt intake and maybe exercising. Cardio definitely helps. Sweating. Um, Fasting, uh, reducing carbohydrates. Yes, there yep. you go. Car and alcohol, especially. Talk, sure. about, talk about something that can blow you up. And um, so, so what they have found, especially in one study with, um, with androgens, is that androgens tend to 
affect or inhibit the cleaning or the, the, the way the body gets rid of excess cortisol. It basically, there's this balance that goes back and forth, as you can tell, and it actually blocks 11-beta-hydroxysteroid uh, dehydrogenase, uh, which is this enzyme that converts cortisol into the less active, less troublesome cortisone. So when that happens, there's more and more cortisol standing. And that's why people like taking prednisone or corticosteroids, they start blowing up and they start getting a moon face and all that. That is what they, this is just a hypothesis because a lot of guys are telling me, Nelson, I took a natural, I'm not losing that water or I checked my estradiol and it's normal or low. So it definitely isn't the case. I'm not saying it, high estradiol doesn't cause Water retention. I'm saying that there may be something else that has nothing to do with estradiol, and it could be cortisol related. So, right. and exercise lowers cortisol, and you know, if you lower your salt intake, you're also going to um, hold less water because the kidneys tend to uh, hold uh, sodium um, while using testosterone replacement in some cases. This is probably the most concerning, scary thing uh, in the field that I've dealt with as an educator and obviously a coach is that you get somebody with excessive edema right. in the ankles and they just assume it's estradiol and it really is an indication potentially not saying 100 percent obviously nothing is 100 percent of cardiovascular problems like like uh, you know lower extremity edema especially concerns about peripheral artery disease your veins your blood flow is not really happening that well it's kind of you know sluggish so there's actually a test that most doctors do mine does it once a year on, on my my physical if you're not getting most people that have access to insurance and a lot of our guys tend to be the luckier ones Please, please, in every physical, every yearly physical, ask for obviously uh, a DRE, a digital rectal exam. I mean, most guys hate that, but we need to know about our prostates. Although, as I said, testosterone has not been proven to, to, to cause prostate cancer. But get your, uh, your blood work done, obviously, your prostate checked, and get this test done where basically they measure your um, your heart rate after they squeeze on both your ankles and your arms. And they said an equation, a difference there. If there is something there, then, you know, you have to act on it and you have to go see a cardiologist. So anytime I see somebody saying, well, I'm holding water, I say, well, where is it? Is it just my face? No, I feel bloated all over. Okay, that's a little bit. But if I'm holding water in my ankles, uh, then uh, it's, it's, it's a, could be cardiovascular. It could be actually a very concerning health issues. So talk to your doctor about it, okay? Really fast because it's a complex table, but this, these are all the studies, not all, let's say a bunch of studies done with androgel and, and patches and injections and and uh, yeah, the, the one that didn't show any effect was really androgel five milligrams. So obviously injections do, do increase estradiol because people are getting penetration of actual testosterone in their blood. The androgen patch, there was no change because androgen was not very effective uh, to increase blood levels anyways. And, and even the gels, some gels are not concentrated enough to get somebody's uh, testosterone high enough to feel better. That's why we see a lot of guys abandoning androgel, you know, test them and all the gels. So are you saying androgel is not effective, Nelson? No, no, I don't want to be sued by, <laughs> by, I don't want to be sued by Abby. No, no, those, those guys have power. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the poorly dosed androgel, that's our word, poorly managed, and poorly dosed. Everything works. It's actually androgel is the number one testosterone product in, in the, market, the world. In the world. I, I, you know, it's, it's a clean product. I used to use it. Um, but a lot of doctors are under, under dosing. So what guys do is that they just lose hope and they say, screw it. I'm not going to even right. I'm either going to stop testosterone or switch to injections. No, I have actually a few uh, of my old clients, I don't do coaching anymore, that are applying testosterone cream from compounding pharmacies twice a day, and they have, you know, 800 nanograms, and they're feeling great, right. and some of them even apply it on their testicles for increased DHT, but not the androgel, androgel is alcohol-based, don't put it on your testicles, so anyways, yes, I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer, the injections do tend to increase a little bit more. So this is kind of a cool site I, 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 I've always used, but I say, you know, I'm going to just post it there, it's called Unilab, dot com um this is slash there no slash one one three where for our european and australian and um you know and um, 
UK and Canada, Canadian friends, you know, they're using all kinds of other uh, units. Um, so they can't, you can actually type in any of these boxes and all the other boxes. Will what, get what is that URL? Ready. It's unitslab.com? Yeah, unitslab. They don't sell labs, but, but that's, it's actually like a reference uh, yeah, website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's pretty cool because I, you know, sometimes I have to use a calculator, so I screw it. Totally. So, yeah. you know, and sometimes you get the P, pico molars per liter, which yeah. is a lot in Europe, or sometimes the Australians send you a pico gram per liter or, you know, things of that nature. So you can choose which one, the, depending on the country, because I get emails from all over the world. So anyways, um, so this is very interesting. This is actually one of those that I'd like to, oh my God, I've already talked, talked this long. Um, this is actually, the, this, is, this is kind of weird. How they got young men and older men they got him to agree to do a study. Obviously, they paid them money because they they gave him a, a hormone, a, a drug that is used in prostate cancer to shut down all your hormones, LH, FSH, testosterone, all of them. And then they reintroduced testosterone in and they injections at, um, at uh, different doses. And they observed their estradiol and their DHT to see how the different doses, and you see on the left-hand side, you see young men, and the right-hand side, you see old men, okay? So on the top, both, uh, the two on the top is estradiol, and the two at the bottom, uh, they did use liquid chromatography, by the way, and the bottoms are DHT, okay? So you see that with higher mm, total uh, testosterone blood levels, you see obviously an increase on everything from DHT to, it makes all sense, right? But you also see that it kind of plateaus, things start plateauing. At least, you know, it depends on how you see the graphic because even on DHT at the bottom on the old men, there's these guys that are having really high DHT in the yeah. middle. But you know, it's a regression analysis, okay? Nothing in, in, in science is perfect when it comes to blood. But what they have found really is that uh, it there's a saturation that it means that you know, there's a level at which, you know, the, the increases of estradiol are not as high right. as, as you go up and up and up. So, or, or DHT for that matter. Okay, so that's actually, you know, good. And this is another uh, study that showed the effects of different testosterone NFA injections also in, in, you know, like I said before, in young and in old men and DHT. But they really, and uh, the top line here is total estradiol and free estradiol. That's where they saw that older men produce more estradiol. Okay, right. that's why the P, uh, you know, you see a, a good P, P value there. And also the E to T ratio. By the way, this is confusing. Some researchers like to divide E by T right. and some others divide T by E. So, <laughs> so there we go. So, but DHT, they didn't see in, uh, all men, a difference between all men and, um, and young men. So, but definitely we see, is that because older men have more fat or is that because aromatase happens more, they're taking more medications that may affect liver metabolism could be both you know could be both uh, so, back, back that slide real quick there's also no way to know whether or not when we have to assume those were mostly im injections right not not sub q yeah this is all i am and that's okay good i'm so you know i'm so glad you brought that up now because yep. i forgot to include that slide I'm paying oh, attention. i know man i forgot to um <laughs> have a slide on because we don't have much data but we already know i mean jay we and know. i we we've know. seen it on the field where um you know, let me tell them, I'm not going to bore you to, with details, guys, but it, we used to, in this field, we used to have uh, doctors prescribe 200 milligrams of testosterone every two weeks. Some doctors even prescribe it once a month, which was crazy. But anyways, every two weeks, that was the package insert information. And, you know, as you well know, and you guys have heard, they, and you say, by the 13th, 12th day, you see a decrease to baseline. So it's it wasn't as effective, but the pharmaceuticals didn't think. So, most people, and I say anecdotally, guys online on their own, experimenters, uh, I call them early adopters. There's bunches of people experimenting. They're what do you call biohackers now? You yeah. guys are gone. They started doing more frequent injections. And obviously, they saw fewer uh, or lower peaks of everything and less, fewer side effects, fewer, yeah. less uh, polycythemia, which is red blood cell uh, increases, less of everything. And then, obviously, uh, in the past four or five years, we started seeing that, hey, you don't have to inject testosterone uh, in the butt with a one and a half inch needle. And <laughs> that was a gauge, by the yeah, way. Yeah, <laughs> I've been using testosterone for 28 years. And unfortunately, I injected with a big gauge for like, the first six That's or seven. crazy. I know. And you have to have somebody do it for you because it's such a big. Anyway, so we are now moving away from that. And we got a lot of data, believe it or not. And people tend to always have issues with uh, female to male 
trans, right. uh, trans, trans, transgenders. Transgender. We got a lot of trans men data from them using subcutaneous um, injections uh, once or twice a week under the skin, either in the you know, abdominal area, you can actually inject it, uh, or even in your legs when, if you have fat there too. Uh, that actually shows that the labels are beautiful, the testosterone levels, and estradiol and all the other issues may actually be lower. So splitting the dose in, 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 in lower uh, uh, dosages and probably even more frequently has actually shown in our world it hasn't been studied dramatically to see differences, but it is almost like something that a lot of people online are already knowing and a lot of doctors are catching up, thank God. So uh, most most of the cash clinics now, the insurance still and doctors are still dealing with the 200 milligrams every two weeks. That's another thing that we're seeing. Uh, insurance companies are denying payment or they have the need pre-authorization letters for testosterone yep. if you're not at a certain level. And then they tell you, by the way, even if you need testosterone, you have to only get androgel or you can only get testem. Right. We, don't, we don't have a deal with any other. So testosterone access through insurance is becoming worse and worse with worse, time, yeah. better and better. So guys are getting just tired of it and just going directly to compounding pharmacies where they can make, you know, products cheaply, even if they're usually right. cash and they're much cheaply than any of the other stuff. And they're also getting their syringes, uh, subcutaneous syringes from companies. So it, the, the field is, is simplifying, not because researchers and clinicians are moving that forward is because patients like us, patients right. that are talking online, are getting more and more experience. And then eventually research follows them and what exactly. they experience. Exactly. So anyways, okay. I got well, it. it's tip of the spear, right? And, and one thing Dr. Rob said on a podcast I did last week, and it applies right here, is that, look, guys, if you're watching this, and Nelson and I are huge advocates of this, and Nelson's always been this, if you do not, if you, in your mind, you cannot afford to spend $3,000 and that's even high range. You know that Nelson, $3,000 a year on your health, then your priorities are out of order. It's that simple. Well, I have to be careful with that statement because I do, I do know a lot of poor people that are trying their best. No, I get that. But I mean, I think even if you're poor, if you're employed, I still think you could come up with 2,500 to $3,000 a year. You just got to mix in, or, or, you sorry. know, and that's rid of fast thing. food. You know, there's a, you know, most good clean and there's some good clinics out there um that charge like a hundred dollars a month uh with uh this is including blood work and i agree and i agree but for the most part HCG. that's 1200 i guess 1200 well, for the most part they're going to hit them with 200 a month probably right yeah and, and you know you work out you have to pay a membership mem uh, membership yeah. and you know there are costs associated but you're right you probably owe that number when you add up everything that it takes to it's pay, close it's probably close you're right it just sounds such a big number but when you divide it yeah but anyways uh and some people tell me nelson i'm, I'm broke i i can only afford my cup, you know, to get it from insurance and right. I can get all the other stuff. I and mean, we had a lecture on HCG and there are other stuff that you take and not, there's not the scope of his talk um, that also is cheap, but it adds up to the cost. Anyways, let's go back to Estrell. Let's focus again, Estrell management. So several clinicians, uh, you know, prescribe an astrosol if the sensitive test um, is, is, you know, 40 to 50. I've even seen doctors going as crazy as 35. So it's a very, it's a very thin line that you, you walk and they start sometimes at 0.5 to one milligram a week. As I said, some, some, some don't do that. Several physicians also prescribe doses as high as one milligram per day. I, I usually don't like to say this is right or wrong about anything because uh, obviously um, they're, they're, there are issues related to saying that, but this is for sure. I can say this is wrong. Okay, do not accept that. Again, even no. if even if you have a placebo effect, oh, I feel great. It really you're gonna end up paying eventually with your brittle bones and God knows what else. Some even some doctors even prescribe an astrosol when starting testosterone replacement, irrespective of estradiol blood levels. I think that's me. Obviously, I'm not a clinician. That's wrong. Also, yeah. let somebody start testosterone, what, you know, measure their estradiol and testosterone Absolutely. at week six or eight and see, okay, this guy's definitely one that's yeah. going to have a problem. But hey, what I hear, this is interesting. You Because I, I ask doctors, why do you, why do, you do that? I say, Nelson, I just don't want to get a phone call. Exactly. Or, that's what they say. In the first two weeks saying my nipples are hurting. That's or, what they say. So, mm -hmm. yeah, unfortunately, yeah, that's unfortunate. Anyways, and many physicians are using their own test too. So tamoxifen is another drug. It definitely has been shown in head-to-head, -head, in um, one head-to-head -head study that really 
tends to uh, reverse um, and treat gynecomastia a lot more effectively um, than, than astrosol. It's just that it also decreases IGF-1. So the guys that are working out are feeling like, well, I'm losing my muscle, I'm losing my pump. So, and there's also some uh, cognitive dysfunction there. So, so as I said, I, I spoke about IGF-1 before. This drug works really well because it blocks not only estradiol, also blocks IGF-1. It works really well, but nobody wants to lose their IGF-1 either because, you know, especially most of us are trying to stay in shape. So uh, there's no data of, um, you know, other CIRMS, um, selective uh, estrogen receptor modulators beyond clomiphene. And even then, that's only to improve testosterone to estradiol ratios. People with gyno do not use clomid. I mean, for that purpose, actually, I know how you feel about clomid, so I'm not going to ask you right now, otherwise we'll have a different lecture, but that's another drug that has not worked for everybody. And surgery, <laughs> and well said. Okay. I'm becoming very uh, political. Wow, that was good. <laughs> So should we be measuring T and E ratios? That's really what. And I think I'm going to start offering that on, on the scanner labs to even divide for people. Or right. um, so uh, most men do not need an astrosol um, yeah. unless they're high aromatizers. Yeah. Um, the 20 to 50, you know, as I said, is, is it's, we have some data. I'll show it. It is recommended to avoid estradiol under 20. I would say we have enough data to say that. Usually high air fat mass increase estradiol. And most men, what happens with men that are a little heavier, they will start testosterone, start working out even better. And testosterone really helps with fat burning. So their fat cells, their fat percent starts decreasing. And so is their estradiol. So, um, you know, you may not need, if you somebody put you on an astrosol the first, second, or the second month, you may not need an astrosol a year later because you're leaner. Okay. So, and insurance doesn't cover an astrosol for a male indication because it's, uh, it's approved only for women with breast cancer. So right. you either get it uh, compounding, some guys get it online from, I'm not going to get into that. No <laughs> issues too. Um, it is a breast cancer drug. Uh, some, there's some evidence that maybe taking zinc may have some um, effects on estradiol. I'm not very 100% sure on that. Uh, compounding pharmacists make it at one milligram, 0.5 and even 0.25 milligrams. I've even heard of uh, company pharmacists making in lower doses than that. Yeah, point the range is here, yeah. Um, blah, blah, blah. And that's, uh, yeah, I already talked about that. It's very powerful. It basically lowers estradiol by at least 70% within 24 hours. Um, and um, they, what happens when you, uh, they're, believe it or not, there are a, lot, a few, not a lot, a few studies on giving an astrosol right. alone, a monotherapy to increase testosterone, because it really blocks that estrogen, uh, estradiol uh, uh, feedback, uh, inhibiting feedback loop, and increases testosterone, not really high levels. I think, Bad idea. Levels, but it really does not improve any of the symptoms. So don't do that. I, some doctors are still doing this. Oh, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Pa on paper, you may look okay, but paper and feeling is not the same. Right. Uh, tamox, there are other two, uh, as I said, tamoxifen. Uh, the other one, we have very little data on Evista, it's called 60 milligrams of real data. So I used it, Nelson. I did use it, if you remember. I yeah. used it for 60 days. It did nothing more than yeah. what tamoxifen did. Really? And tamoxifen, what did tamoxifen do for you? <laughs> Not much. I mean, you know, as soon as I stopped taking it, I mean, it never got rid of it at all. Again, I we know mine was more glandular, or probably IGF, but it 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 didn't do anything different. Now, I am very familiar with all the studies, and there's no question that raloxifene does bind harder, significantly harder. So it may effectively work for some guys that have you know um, um, hormonal induced gyno, but I I I don't. For me, it didn't. There was no difference than tamoxifen. And you also had gyno only on one side, right? Yes, it was just one side. Yes, I've never ever had an, an issue since then. See, yeah. see, see what happens, you know, like, uh, you know, like, how do you explain that one breast? It's, it's crazy. It's, yeah. So that tells you how, how, how many variables are involved here. Right. I'm not going to really go into the details. You can download this. We're running out, actually running out of precious time, but they're, you know, femar, which is letrozole and uh, or mycin, which it's, it's talk, talked a lot about because it's an androgen. It's also an androgen but it uh, is one of those uh, suicide um, inhibitors and you can read more about it um, 
when you download the slides, okay? DHEA supplements can also increase estradiol. And there are many studies here that you show, you see that line where all the dots are on the right hand side. So keep an eye on that. I mean, DHEA may be a good thing, but um, keep an eye on that too. HCG also increases estradiol, obviously, as we all know. But uh, what we saw, at least in this study, where they provide 3,000 IUs, a high dose, um, for, uh, for three days, they see that it goes up and then it actually plateaus. So I think there's a plateau effect also when using HCG. Uh, so as you know, I'm very, I'm, I'm an HCG fan for libido, but um, so we'll probably spend what, five more minutes? Are we okay? I, I think, I mean, we can, let's just ask everybody, you guys thumbs up if you're okay to keep going. I say we go to 4.30. Okay, let me do it real because this this yeah, is just keep really, going and whatever we have we we have just keep yeah. going. Sorry guys, stuff. you can always pause it, you can always rewind it, you exactly. can always walk away from the chair and come back. So <laughs> uh, you know, I'll, you know, I say keep going. This is really amazing information. Keep thank going. Thank you. I worked my ass off, man. So, anyways, um, you know, I do everything for you, Jay. You know, you uh, I, I, I got <laughs> why I'm sitting here right now. <laughs> anyway, so uh, estradiol and sex driving men. Um, Actually, Dr. Ramasamy is a friend of mine. He, he's a really good urologist at Baylor. I have a awesome you know, that I did quoted, quoted in the book. Quoted yeah, in the book. yeah, nice guy. So he actually did a little bit of a review of his charts on uh, for, uh, depending on uh, divided men in those that have below or above 300 nanograms of testosterone, which are I mean, that's a definition of hypogonadism, and and or uh, low and high estradiol, uh, low being meaning below five high above 50. And what he found, obviously, as we well know, he, I don't, he didn't report free testosterone. I wish he had that higher testosterone levels, um, increased libido, obviously. And, um, and those with higher estradiol uh, also when he controlled for everything else. So when he, when he presented this at a conference, people were really like, oh my God, that is so untrue. And, and this was one of the first little pilots that started like really shining at, wait a minute, guys, it's, it's not probably all you think it is that uh, having higher estradiol will decrease. There, as I said, everything in hormones is a new shape. Yes. Uh, low is too bad, optimum is good, and then high is where things uh, also are bad. Almost all of them. So when we say high estradiol, where, where does that mean? Is that high here? Or is that when the curve starts going up? We, right. we, you know, 50 is probably not a bad number to go by since that seems to be referred uh, to. And this is actually probably the study that Life Extension Foundation used to to push the mantra that estradiol is an evil drug, evil hormone. Um, it's a small st study done on men that had cardiovascular issues like prior heart disease. Or now, Nelson, let me just make a comment because I think guys get confused. Um, first off, this is gold. And, and by the way, we have a bunch of people writing in saying the same thing. But uh, the 50 number, even to me, is hard to quantify because, as you know, these these labs have been based on the poor, um, you know, the, the, the incorrect methods to measure. So most of the data isn't even accurate. I mean, even if you're using like, you know, the, the liquid C stuff now, I, a lot of it is extrapolated or pushed in with other mean scores and relevance. So it's, it's really tough. I still think it has to go by the symptoms of the patient. I, I see guys, you know this, we have guys in the 60s and 70s who are fine. Yeah, they're actually really doing well. Great libido and everything. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So no, I really do believe we. It's hard to have a real qualitative number. I mean, I know you're a statistician and, and, and a data guy, as, it, as am I. But yeah, I don't want guys it, to get confused. If, if you ask me, if you know, if I was in a meeting with researchers, if there is a clear evidence on what the upper limit is, I would say no. There's no clear evidence. I agree. Uh, there is a kind of an, and this is also another study that actually used it wrong, the, the old test. It's an old study, but this is a study that actually freaked people out. Really, they, right. they separated only 500, well, 501 men. Um, most of them, our, you know, average and medium actually was 58, and they had chronic heart disease, and they followed them for three years, and they saw, and they, they measured the, the, the percent three-year survival rate depending on your estradiol blood level. So obviously, the very low estradiol guys died faster. Die, you know, they die Absolutely. more. Then, you know, as estradiol going up in the range, obviously, you know, you even have a control group of 20 to 30. And then when they went beyond uh, 37.40, you know, in an old test, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's still good survival 
you know, you see it, it's almost as comparable score tile too, but people start saying, oh, there's already going down after 37. So this doesn't show that even 37 is bad or even 40 is bad because, you know, it's actually showing that low estradiol is bad, you right. know, really. But uh, this was taken in the wrong direction with uh, marketing. I have to say that Life Extension article was the beginning of the end for a lot of us. Um, this is where I really, this study was where I got really interested in this testosterone estradiol ratio, which I'm kind of obsessed about trying to get Dr. Lipschultz here at Baylor to do more studies. Um, so they actually looked at guys that had, uh, you know, a proper, uh, qual good quality sperm combined uh, com compared to, and compared them to men with te testicular failure with, you know, basically they could not um, produce sperm or low quality sperm to have their, their pregnant, their wife pregnant. Uh, and then what they found is that the ones that were fertile um, had a, an average uh, ratio of T, and I have an example on the left hand side of how you do that. It's basically, you're dividing two different numbers there different units. That's why people get so confused. Like in this example, dividing 800 nanograms of testosterone, the per deciliter, by 42 picograms of estradiol comes up with a ratio of 19. So, okay. So that's about 14.5. That's the only study I have actually, and this has nothing to do with libido, nothing to right. do with water retention, nothing to do with gyno. This only has something to do with sperm quality and production. So uh, we know that low T to E ratios, uh, at least seven here, 6.9, um, these guys were not really fertile. So I think there's something there. Um, there's another one here that actually was um, recently presented at a conference and I cannot get a hold of a private investigator. I've been trying to find his email. So, so if uh, somebody's listening, they work with them in, in um, I think he's based in Chicago, Dr. Um, uh, Nick Hill Gupta. Uh, no, Illinois, yeah. So he, he actually um, had a questionnaire on sex, sexual function and libido to uh, this man that he's been treating. And um, he saw that estradiol was not even at 50. And he used the, the right test, the liquid chromatography, was not even uh, associated with improved libido. And there was no correlation between total uh, testosterone and libido. The only mm -hmm. thing he saw correlation is free testosterone, which makes sense. We see more data. And on T to E ratio, that was predictive of, so this is one of those studies I just was presented at a conference. I don't have the paper, unfortunately, because I'm trying to get it. Um, but it's telling me there's something there on, we know the free, the free testosterone data, we, we know that's yeah, you know, that's a strong data, but the TE ratio. So I do predict that more clinicians are going to be measuring T to E, especially after I find out what the ratio right. of, uh, that he looked at, because he didn't even disclose the ratio, which is kind of uh, cruel to be honest with you. Um, the another one is the role of testosterone estradiol on body composition. This is the best, uh, the the best study in the field, the, the yeah. most um, clean. They spend big bucks. They 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 shut down. Once again, they brought in this guys, 188, 20 to 50 years of age. They gave him a, a blocker, uh, Solavex, which is uh, given to men with prostate cancer to completely block LH, FSH, testosterone, estradiol, everything else. And then a uh, cohort one or two, they would actually give them uh, androgel, <laughs> it comes up again, a different grams per day to increase testosterone and obviously estradiol because testosterone and estradiol increase with, with testosterone, obviously. And the uh, cohort two, they also gave him Arimidex to one milligram daily, once again, to block estradiol all the way down to like nothing, okay? And they wanted to, and they measure their body composition by DEXA, I mean, they spend money. Strength, uh, libido, this is the most scientific study in the field when it comes to estradiol. And they found that low levels, um, it was like 12 or so picograms were, in, were uh, associated with higher fat mass. That's crazy. Lower improvements of sexual function and, uh, and uh, subcutaneous mass area, any visceral fat too. So estradiol, and I, I, I've had two, I've read three more papers after this, estradiol is connected really strongly to fat yeah. mass. Absolutely. Testosterone is more of a muscle uh, uh, hormone. Estradiol is the bone and fat hormone which, you know, low levels will screw up your bone and screw up your fat. Yep. So that's something that, I, you know, it's yeah, I repeat it because when guys want to bring their estradiol down, this is, and, and, and sexual dysfunction too could occur. My last, I, I think this is my last slide before I move into, yeah, my, another promotional slide. 
here. Um, Spectra Cell Laboratories are in Houston and they're a pretty good company, been around for a while, where they measure uh, blood levels, not blood levels, uh, let me rephrase that, uh, intracellular levels, right. red blood cells of vitamins and deficiencies, amino acids, etc. And they actually have a very good, I'm not going to go through this, but you can download it and look at it. In a, I think you have to expand the, uh, the screen so you can see the fine print. But there are many vitamins um, and, and amino acids and, and, and mostly vitamins that excess or, or, or deficiencies can, can affect estradiol or aromatase uh, inhibition, right? So um, another plug-in um, for my company, Discounted Labs, I, as I said, I'm, I'm honor and uh, I also made sure that I would improve access to blood testing by everybody. Awesome. I was tired of, of paying high prices. So there's an estradiol test for $51 is the cheapest on, in the United States. And there's a free estradiol. I tried to keep the cost, as, but as you can tell, see, it's double the price. So some guys want to test free estradiol. We have no data. We probably will see data, but it's also a lot more expensive for those that are really obsessed about how much estradiol is bound. So Nelson, how long do these two tests take for a guy who just wants to get this measured? Oh, I'm so glad, I'm glad you're asking all these questions. Yeah, that's a, it's a test that takes the longest. I mean, liquid chromatography takes at least a week. So, and, uh, and LabCorp uses uh, an outsourced uh, lab a specialized lab, so yeah. that takes also some time. So that's where I get people complaining, well, I've been waiting for five days or, you know, so it is, it takes like around five business days. Right. So it makes a difference on what time of the week you do, what day of the week, because the, the outsourcing lab only processes twice a week. But but as I said, it's, uh, it's the most effective one, the most uh, accurate one. And uh, we're about to, within a month and a half, um, have good news, we're about to automize, um, automate, I would say, the site and people are not uh, will not are, will not be required to wait that long for for a PDF a lab request order or even nice there. so it'll just be instant it's yeah no, 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 no human involvement so it's it's taking me a while and then you just had very, to just convert to the AI didn't you you just had to do it man. it takes it takes uh, it, it, it has not been easy <laughs> but anyways I, I I'm very happy um, I'm very happy also about the support I think great news community, so I appreciate it I think this is. Uh, oh, the last blog I said I was plugging. Uh, Clinic Optimizers is really my last uh, obsession. I, I started with my friend, uh, David Bruce, and uh, we provide mostly training on, like this one, on topics and products that are more focused in the com uh, compounding world. Because what happens with compounding products is that most doctors do not know how to prescribe them because they only get information about uh, medications from pharmaceutical right. companies. So obviously they're not, they're just not used to it. So we're trying to break that barrier and, and providing more training to doctors that want to know more about compounding uh, products and how to prescribe them. And I said everything from testosterone to thyroid to HRT for women to uh, peptides to uh, even some over the counter stuff and hair, hair uh, restoration creams and gels. There's, I mean, when you go into a compounding pharmacy menu, like Empower Pharmacy, a 503B FDA approved, the menu is overwhelming how many things uh, you can actually get there at a cheaper price. So I think that's, and I apologize for being so self-promotional, but I worked my ass off for this size. No, it's good. And let me just, say, <laughs> well, let me just say, you know, to, to echo, if you guys are working with a physician, it's not ordering the right blood tests and you're on testosterone optimization therapy, then what, what are you doing? Okay. Again, this is about being proactive. This is about taking full responsibility. Nelson and I and other great clinicians, and now his company are out here trying to educate, you know, you guys and doing our best job, but we can't do anything unless you take the onus on yourself. The initiation or the, excuse me, the initiative has to come from you. So do a good job, go to your physician or your clinician and explain this stuff to them, you know, point this stuff out. We always say this, the more information and data you can provide to your doctor, the more apt they're going to be able to listen to you. Because if you come at them in a, you know, a combative, non-tactful way, as Nelson and I always say, they're going to shut you down instantly because you're not the physician they are. Okay. So you got to do this the right way. And, and again, you know, that's very cheap. I mean, for God's sakes, guys, 51 bucks to do a sensitive. No, um, no. So we got a bunch of questions. Um, it, it's a perfect question. Let me ask this first question and you can answer this, but so what are they looking for in free E2 from a level standpoint? I don't know. I really don't know. I have a, I have a range on the site that I picked right. from one tiny little study, 
But, um, you know, in, when it comes to testosterone, for instance, we're looking at free testosterone. We're looking at concentration of 2% or higher. If you're under 2%, you know, maybe you have more, uh, too much sex hormone binding globulin, although there's no such thing. In estradiol, we don't know what the percentage is, but it, we're also going for more or less from 2 to 5% of maximum, mostly 3% of, um, of total estradiol um, being free. But as I said, and I've been looking and maybe I haven't looked enough, but I think I have on getting more data. Uh, I want to, if there are any researchers, and researchers are watching your your lectures, uh, your seminars, uh, Jay. If there are any researchers out there, I'd like to uh, propose that, you know, if you guys are getting any funding to look at free estradiol and also uh, even estradiol, uh, testosterone to estradiol ratio in all the measurements of uh, libido, uh, erectile function, mood, um, you know, quality of life, instead of just measuring total testosterone, which is really right. outdated, we need to look beyond that because we really have enough testosterone data we have 20, 30 years, we need to move beyond that and look more into the ratios of these hormones, the free uh, components of these hormones. So anyways, I'm just gonna get off my soapbox again. No, I mean, I'm glad you're saying that. And let me just say this too, because I know you agree with me. The number one thing that any of us can do on testosterone optimization therapy is to maintain physical health by lowering body fat, okay? Everything seemingly improves when you are leaner, Okay. Um, I, I, it, you know, we talked about edema and salt retention and all these different things. I mean, this isn't obviously a, a, a lecture talking about health and, and stuff, but I know that all causes mortality, everything improves when you are leaner. Okay. So the number one thing you can do is when you're beginning this therapy is, you know, we can, we can part and parcel it, but try to lose body fat, like make that a, you know, overriding overbearing concern of yours as you do this therapy, because everything seemingly improves as you get leaner. Yeah, yeah, and you know, that's where you come in with all the nutritional and exercise information, and there's so much more. I mean, also I tell people, don't forget your thyroid. Absolutely. Sometimes, you know, we all talk about testosterone, that's all, and we don't, we don't remember that thyroid has the same, the low thyroid has the same symptoms as low testosterone, or even worse. So there are other, other things, you know, it's, it is about finances and, and getting access to blood testing too, I think. Uh, uh, we're lucky in this country, even though people still um, right. bad mouth our system, we have a system in which if you have the cash and you have the knowledge, you can have access to many things that Canadians, Europeans, uh, Australians, I love my guys there, I'm trying to help as much as I can. They don't have access to, to yeah. the menu of items that um, unfortunately a cash basis system in the United States provides. Um, it, we wish it was an insurance. The insurance would be paying for this, but unfortunately, that's not the way the world is going, as we can tell. And in socialized medicine com countries, which more power to them, I really think uh, socialized uh, medicine should be medical access should be a right for everybody. And I agree. I'm going to get into the politics of that, but I do, I do believe that um, that we are lucky to have access to. Right blood testing because I get emails Nelson can I get a blood test like order it from Europe I said no uh, can I get some compounding products no can I get uh, a, a sensitive estradiol testing no <laughs> so people actually get upset at me they think I said well I have nothing to do with it right. but when I'm trying and I'm seeing this is I'm just too close this is what I'm very excited about now is I'm seeing more and more activists in Australia, we have guys right. creating testosterone groups in Australia, uh, in, in the UK. So this movement that we've somehow started in the United States is spreading on men's health and activism. So, and I'm, I hope I can be a mentor to many of those guys. So You so already are, you already are, man. Come on, give me a sure. break. I, again, I always say, I would not be here if it wasn't for you. Okay, we got some really good questions. I'll let you answer them and I'll take a stab at some of them. If, okay. if I don't feel your answer's good enough, how's that? Um, how about this? So concerning an optimal testosterone to estrogen ratio, an E2 ratio, based on your research, guys, what is the optimal ratio? I know the answer you're going to say, we don't know, but what do you think? Well, you know, at least that study show 14 and above. Okay. Um, I, you know, nobody has ever, you know, I've never seen data on what's the highest didn't, you can didn't, accomplish. Didn't you give me a study though from Ramsey and that YouTube video that he was saying 10 to one. No, 10, 10 is playing with fire. I, 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 mean, really I mean, I would never agree with that. But no, didn't no. he say that? Didn't he put that out there? Yeah, but, you know, 14. Yeah, we, we both don't agree The data we have, if I have to be, if I just pay dice, I would right. say 
2020 will be for sure. Where at least sperm production, if you don't have any other problems, right, it's right, not that right. simple. Um, and and even I'm I'm speculating because we have no data on right. all the other side effects related to estradiol. So yeah, if you divide your total uh, testosterone divided by your estradiol, even you know as I said, I showed the uh, the equation how to do it, and the units are different. Yep. Yeah, I would keep it at 20 or up or above. To be I honest. agree. But as I said, I'm speculating. Okay. Well, well, you have to be because we don't, the data isn't uniform. I mean, we know that they're not using the accurate tests and all the data that we're extrapolating from. It's not, it's not even, it's not uniform. Um, the, the other question then, which is a good question I want you to answer, please, is uh, since we believe, you and I, obviously, not all the physicians, since we believe AIs are not good, I love how he says that, what are the most important things to do to lower E2? And then he says, weight loss or lower dose of testosterone? What, what is your answer to that, your opinion? Both, yeah, I mean, both. I mean, you, you, are, you are the guy on weight loss for sure and, and fat loss for sure. Um, also, be very careful on what you take in, what stuff you put in your exactly. mouth. It sounds, sounds bad. But anyways, on supplements or even medications you're taking, um, and when you download the handbook, the hand uh, handout, you're gonna see a list of medications. I didn't even go through that. There's an appendix on gyno, and there's so many of them. Man, I'm, I'm I've been positive HIV positive for 34 years, and I took this drug, um, uh, efibrinus, that we didn't know back then. We took it for four years, and a lot of people were having high estradiol, fat, gyno. And, and you know, but we didn't know. So a lot of new drugs are coming through, are disrupting men's hormones. And sometimes we don't know. Sometimes all it takes is a Google search. You know, the name of the medication you're going to take and the word estradiol. If there's any data, it'll show up there. So unfortunately, yeah, aging also the older yeah. women. Uh, but, you know, I think with a good body composition, uh, not abusing, um, you know, even there's some data on abusing uh, pot or alcohol and how that, uh, that affects um, estrogen, uh, even receptors. So, you know, don't abuse anything. I mean, I like, I like my tequila and I like my pot, but, you know, <laughs> I try not to abuse anything. So everything is about that you, you, you curve, you know, too little is not fun and too much is too, too much fun. Well, I, I like no. Latin women, Nelson, but I'm only allowed one. <laughs> hey, you, got, you got a great one. I, I hey, love Monica. So yeah, she's amazing. Um, blessed guy. Um, but you have a good one too. So, so, so real quick, let me just throw in one other thing. We got another great question. Um, and I'm always defaulting to clinicians and I know Nelson agrees with me. Um, I posited in the new book that you modulate the dosage first and then you modulate the frequency second. And they could be inverse. It just depends on how long you've been on TRT, your age, all these other things. As Nelson has very accurately said, there's a lot of factors here to take into consideration. Before the AI is, is induced. Now, that's not to say if Nelson's right, that if you have extremely out of range um, E2 levels at the initiation of therapy and it's medically required, there's a medical necessity, that's different. But we're talking about a normal person, which is what we're trying to talk about whenever we measure this data, who's starting testosterone, as Nelson agrees with me. Now, obviously, we're not talking about people that are trying to have children or maintain fertility, but testosterone in isolation, if the clinician is really paying attention and really trying to understand baseline lab values of everything that happens, Nelson hit it. He already said it during the, during the podcast. It should, should, be, should be used for six months. I mean, excuse me, six weeks, maybe eight weeks to see what's happening. Um, but that's, 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 you know, Dr. Rob agrees with that. Merrill agrees with that. Meehan agrees with that. Chrysler, even Chrysler now agrees with that. Yeah. And so, so the reality is, is the top guys, the top clinicians in their field, and you know, Lip Schultz better than I do. Um, th this is what they're doing with their patients for the most part. So that's what I think is the best. But as you said, Nelson, we're not here to disparage any clinicians, Putting guys, as you very accurately said, and I 100% agree with you, putting guys on an AI at the start of therapy is a mistake in most cases when there's not a medical need. And so we have to be really, really careful with a lot of these, you know, clinics, as you said, they're jumping up like Starbucks. Um, if that's what you're getting, you know, you're watching us, you're reading our books, you're watching our podcast, you're going on Nelson's site. You have to make sure you're paying attention to the top people in the field, clinician-wise, thought leaders, because you know, this is where we're at right now. It's like you said, it's very experimental. 
This is a very fluid, yeah. very dynamic situation. And what happens too is that in the in the world there are five groups that write uh, testosterone replacement guidelines in the country, in the world, and none of them mention estradiol management. Right. None of them. They mention obviously uh, polycythemia, hematocrit, blah blah blah, right? But not not one measure, not one. There are five medical groups. So so guidelines for doctors are not reflective of what we have already learned in the past few years. It, it, research lacks behind yeah. uh, this, this field at least for five years, probably more. So that's when you get in trouble when you like come to a doctor that is really close minded. And the first thing you say is, I, I read this on the internet. Right, that's the done. worst thing you can tell a doctor that is close minded because <laughs> they're going to shut down right there. Nelson Virgil and Jay Campbell <laughs> no, say. And don't mention my name for sure, for God's Nelson sake. Nelson Virgil and Jay Campbell say. No, that's a crazy, crazy. Like there, there are no doctors. But, anyways, <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a chemical engineer. I'm a data guy. I'm obsessed with data, as you guys can tell. I, I believe in, in, in conservative measures. I, 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 if you've read my work or yes. seen my videos, you know that I'm obsessed with data or the lack of actually, to be honest with you. So don't, what I'm trying to say, when you approach a doctor and they had not measured estradiol, don't say you read it on the internet. Right. If you can, and I'll, I'll facilitate that, I'll probably just do that in Excel, I'll have a few pages there, where I, I have, uh, papers, the main papers on Estradal, downloadable. This actually a review yep. paper, a beautiful yep. review paper. Just download it, print it out. You say, hey, doctor, I know you're busy one day. You know, if you're one of these days, I'm, I'm bringing you a paper. They may say, oh, you know, whatever. But they know, they know you're reading papers, which is very different than saying you got it on the internet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you, and you get treated, definitely treated differently. Another thing I'm telling patients to develop a good relationship with a doctor if you're happy with your doctor, refer your friends and family because a doctor that gets referrals, it will treat you better. I'm sorry, this is yep. a world we live in. So just make sure that you read, you know, you, word of mouth that you, you tell, hey guys, this guy is doing, doing, or this clinic, because there's so many bad apples in this field doing horrible things that is either going to get so a few people shut down or company pharmacies in trouble, which is unfortunately because that industry is now being attacked by pharma. So we have to be very careful on how not only we approach our healthcare, but the fact is that we have it good in the United States. Yes. We need to protect that, that, that fact that we have it good in many ways. And we have to, to have access and education. So that's why there are people like us that we're not clinicians, but we're trying to bridge that gap in lack of knowledge and understanding and abuse of, of different things. So I'm, I'm going to, once again, I've been getting on my soapbox, but it is the only opportunity I get when I'm on your videos. No, I mean, I'm glad you're on your soapbox. I, I'll put you on there more. So there's a couple <laughs> more questions. Are you okay to answer a couple more questions? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually, I'm on the roll, man. Yeah, you are, dude. I got, I always bring the best out of you, bro. Come on. <laughs> All right. So Michael, what's up, dude? Michael Geizo um, asked a great question. And I also will get to yours, William, in a second. So he says, what do we know about E2 binding to the prostate and potentially, oh, here we go. You knew, you knew Michael would do this. Activating genes associated with prostate cancer. Before you answer, Nico Sakos, which is on our you know Facebook walls. He's a brilliant researcher in Greece. That's the guy to go to. Michael, I already know you know you speak with him. You're close to him, but I, he's probably trying to put you over a barrel right now, Nelson. He wants to hear your answer. <laughs> well, you know, I, I get confused with that because a lot of that, kind of data comes from in vitro. And the fact is we have at least three or four studies that gave estradiol creams yep. to men with prostate cancer. Why? Because they feel men with prostate cancer that get their testosterone blocked. And and a lot of them do. You know, to be honest with you, the, the, the one of the biggest concerns or fears as a man that has been on testosterone for whatever, 30 years or so, um, is prostate prostate yeah. cancer, even though we have very good data on mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, it doesn't start, whatever. But I've always had that because I'm, I'm old school. I come from the years where they used to tell you that. And so, far, you. and so far, my prostate is great. My PSA has never been high. So I, I think it's genetics too. It doesn't run in my family. In some yeah. families, it definitely runs. And you have to be very careful. But what I'm trying to, to say is that uh, when, when this man um, get this uh, testosterone blockage therapy, they they go to hell. They go. They get tired. Right, of they're course. They get fat. They lose bone density. No erectile function. I mean, it's the end. It's it's the it worst is, yeah. thing having to deal with a disease that, uh, as a man, 
completely destroys your quality of life. So anyway, so one of the ways they were looking at is to actually seeing what happens if you give a man estradiol alone without obviously increasing testosterone. And what they found is in this man, prostate cancer, their cancer did not worsen and they felt better in many ways. They're more cognitively in better mood. They even some sexual function, some yeah. desire, not a cryo function, desire related. So those studies actually make me debate all this in vitro thing about you know prostate uh, receptors, uh, estrogen receptors and prostate cancer. They make me debate that. So I'm, whoever says it's black and white, I mean, I asked Lipschultz, he's like a top urologist, and he tells me, he agrees with me. It's like, you know, we haven't seen any data right. that actually proves that, you know, uh, with or without testosterone in the system, estradiol has a main role in, like testosterone doesn't really have a main right. role on, on so, you know, it is there, it is in vitro data. There's some data there that says that, you know, that, that estrogen is implicated in, in some prostate cancers. By the way, not all prostate cancers are the same. You know, some, some are genetic, uh, different genetic mutations of different, different origins. So I just haven't seen the data. I've seen data that they give estradiol to men on prostate cancer with no testosterone and they feel better and they don't have worsening. So that's the only thing I go by because yeah. it's human data. It's actual human data, right. not in vitro lab data. So that's it. I, that's, I, my, I my, that's well said. My only comment would be, I would not want to have my testosterone suppressed. Oh my God. Just to, just to survive cancer. I'm sorry. Uh, so last question. And by the way, guys, uh, thank you so much for watching. This has been a phenomenal podcast. I think this is our best podcast to date, brother. I think so. um, great information. And everybody's saying the same thing that's been watching live. So I think this will do really well when we put on YouTube. And we're going to have a few more like this. So I'm, oh, I'm yeah, actually, many more, I've, many become, more. <laughs> I've become a PowerPoint uh, OCD guy now. <laughs> I already know what the next one is, but we'll share that off the air. So uh, this is a really good question. It's going to be crazy. Probably you probably heard it before, but why not add Masteron, the anabolic steroid Masteron with TRT? Are we really going to talk about that? <laughs> I think it's a good question because no, it's not Masteron. They're talking about no, they're not talking about Masteron. No, well, what, what they, what read, they, read, read what they're saying. Are they saying something? Are they saying actually Masteron? Yeah, he said, why not add Masteron with TRT? Well, I actually just had a discussion about that with Dr. Rob two weeks ago. Now he brought it up. I don't use that, but uh, because That's again, insane. it's DHT qualities. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, okay. Let's talk about that. I, I forgot to put a slide on the HD. Yeah. There's actually a study done in HIV, HIV positive men with gynecomastia, because yes. as I said, we have more gyno because of medications. And they, um, there's a gel in in Germany that is an Dactrim. It's called. Right. You remember you HD. told me to try to use that when I had my gyno. Yeah, is it, is, no, you yeah. can't. You cannot get it. I mean, it's right. very hard right. to get now uh, from Germany. But they actually showed really good results on just applying DHT gel on the um, nipple area. Right. Actually excellent results. So DHT itself competes for that right. estrogen receptor. So there's some anabolic steroids that are DHT analogs, right. like even oxanolone. They're fun. You know, that people don't realize they're actually dropping their estradiol to very low levels. Yeah, very low. Uh, I used to use oxanolone and I have to say I was like shocked that my estradiol was undetectable and I'm never taking an astrosol. Undetectable. Crazy. Wow. And because I back then I didn't know what I know Did now. They also trash your HDL? Yes, yeah, trashes yeah, your HDL. Yeah, 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 so yeah. because once again, once you bring estradiol down, your HDL That's going down suffer too. too. So it, 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 what I'm trying to say is like, yes, you know, blocking some, bringing some DHT and it's good for libido. There's actually an oral drug, um, what do you call that drug? I think in Europe too, um, that increases DHT. We see proviron, some, proviron. Proviron, yeah, which is, you know, and it's not approved in the U.S., Masteron is not approved in the U.S., so I cannot legally talk about it, and that's an underground drug, and it's not approved in any country for human use anyways. So, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say anything more. I'm I really done. Cause I, so, 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 we're not, so let me just say this. So you're right. So Masteron is not an illegal drug, but do you believe that something like Proviron is worth looking at down the road, not the same medication? Because you know, obviously – Proviron is legal in, in Europe. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's actually being studied for sexual function improvement. Right. What people forget about Proviron or DHT in general is that DHT also blocks testosterone, which means that DHT actually, and I unfortunately, in those diagrams that we show, we don't have DHT, right. the inhibi inhibition loop too. There's an inhibition loop. So you increase DHT too much, your testosterone in that cascade, unless you're taking testosterone injection, goes down. But anyways, so so 
what we're finding out, and this is only the guys taking uh, compounding creams, uh, right. there, there's a beauty to using some compounding creams that are not alcohol based. You put them on the, on the scrotum on your balls and actually that tissue increases and um, produces uh, DHT a lot more. There's more, right. uh, um, um, you know, um, five alpha right of taste there. So those guys are playing with the DHT a lot in a more efficient way than I think that injecting because injections don't cause that 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 effect. So uh, in the United States legally, what can we do to increase the HD not only for lipid for um, <laughs> for libido but also to do some maybe some manipulations on my Strudao effect on on the receptors uh, is uh, scrotal creams not androgel. The androgel is alcohol based, it'll burn your 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 ball sack um, creams and. Um, and, um, you know, there's some data on zinc supplementation, but we have no other no. way to increase the HD. That's where Europe, I guess, has a little bit of access. So if you're injectable, if you're using injections and you're a long-term user and you're not abusing and you've got great lab values, the only real option would be to somehow get a clinician in Europe to send you ProViron? No, I mean, there, there are guys on injections using compounded creams also com in combination. Oh, so you're saying actually just add the cream yeah, above yeah. and beyond. See, I've never done that. Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because that is a sure thing. It's a sure thing. It increases your DHT. So, and there's nothing wrong with as long as you keep... So what would the dosage be if somebody, so somebody on injections, what would they use additionally? Well, it depends on their blood levels of testosterone, but let's say they're 800 or even 900 right. nanograms. Uh, you know, it requires very little, like, you know, maybe no more than... Is grams, you know, because of course, it's of course. 100 or 200 milligrams per gram of cream. It's a very different dosage. So basically, one gram of cream max, no more than that. Usually, androgel is five to seven grams of cream. It's basically very little because you're already supplementing testosterone, course, right? From so it just counts. Need, yeah. So I, I know two of my ex clients because I don't have uh, coaching clients anymore. We're doing that successfully. So as I said, they're mainly guys out there. They're really bright doing the research and not taking too many big chances. It's really, there's another part of the DHC story that is, well, DHC is, is linked to prostate cancer or linked to, to benign prostate and hyperplasia. And it really it hasn't. There's a beautiful, yes. one day, I think we'll cover a DHC in a lecture. There's a beautiful mm -hmm. review paper that says none of that. There is a good link between DHT and libido though. That's a very good link there. Uh, but anyways, uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, no, no. I mean, yeah. honestly, guys, um, thank you so much for watching. We still have a good number, but I don't see any other questions. Any, anything that you see that is, you know, like I haven't covered or that is no, not, dude. I mean, this that is, is not off the wall, not off the wall, and not illegal. <laughs> no, but I'm really glad that we brought that up because we covered it in a way that's legal, even though it is an important issue. I mean, I I think that the proviron loophole is kind of weird, but. I mean, you're yeah. right. About and here too, here for a compounding pharmacy, a compounding pharmacy cannot make DHT gel. That's Even though there is not an anabolic effect, we know DHT doesn't increase muscle mass. Right. There's, exactly. not a, um, there's probably a betterment of mood effect, but there is not an anabolic effect. So here in the United States is illegal to make a DHT cream or gel, which is Same. like really... It's crazy. We have estradiol creams. We have testosterone creams. And you're going to remove one of metabolites from that list. Same. So, no. so don't get me started. I can go on forever on the legalities of, <laughs> of dumb decisions. By um, All right. Well, um, I'm going to wrap this up, guys. This has been a phenomenal podcast. We thank you guys, especially for some of you guys have been on from the all. They all said it's been great, too. Thank you guys for watching. So uh, we'll, we'll, we will be announcing, I'm sure, another one coming up in March. And uh, we appreciate you guys watching. Check, take it. Uh, you know how to find us. Please, my shameful plug, uh, go, go to uh, Amazon and buy the book. It's either available on Kindle or paperback. You can also just go to totbible.com. And, of course, support Nelson, discountedlabs.com. Make sure you're a member of excelmail.com. And then if you're a clinician, clinicoptimizers.com, correct? Yeah, thanks a lot, Jay. I appreciate awesome, it. Awesome. Okay, guys, thank you so much.